four hours RA, which is back to zero hours. It encompasses uh, 7,800, 7,840 deep sky objects. Why then does the final object, NGC 7840, uh, have a right ascension greater than zero hours? It's, it's RA is zero hours, eight minutes. A, the positional measurements have improved since the 1880s when the a NGC was being assembled. B, uh, 7840 has traveled in space uh, in 150 years, so of course it has drifted eastward in the sky. C, Precession since the 1880s has moved the RA coordinates westward. So we have those three questions. If you know, if you want to uh, participate, send your answers to secretary at astroleague.org. Uh, one more slide here, and then I'll be out of out of your hair. Our, our astronomically live presentation will be on Friday, December 16th at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. We're going to be featuring uh, the astronomical league officers. Um, a lot of people, a lot of times, they, they, they're, they're not shown. They're always behind the scenes doing stuff. But we'd like to introduce the officers so you can get a chance to say hello and, and see who, who they are. Uh, we're going to have another speaker, Bob King, who you probably all know. Uh, he'll be talking about this, the, the, the coming solar, the solar cycle we're in and how all, all the neat stuff that the sun will be doing, I hope, and continues to do. And then we got the 2023. One final comment, uh, lower right-hand corner says we got the Astronomical League 75th anniversary. Well, actually that is gonna have to be uh, uh, put aside now because today, uh, November 15th, marks uh, 76.0 years since the, since the league began. So uh, we've been around for a while and we like helping out amateurs. Uh, always remember the Astronomical League is here for you. Thank you. Okay. That's great. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Scott, for having me on. I appreciate you giving me yeah, a little time there to, to talk about this or that. Of course. You all have a good Thanksgiving, too. So. Yep. <laughs> yes, that's right. That's right. If you guys didn't have a chance to watch the uh, last uh, Astronomical League live programs, uh, you know, they've had a couple of really fantastic uh, speakers and uh, just overall programming has been very, very nice on the Astronomical League Live. Uh, I am trying to remember the gentleman's name that was on the last one. Um, Dr. But, uh, Dr. Shane Larson? Yeah. Shane Larson? Shane Larson. What, what an incredible Excellent. speaker. Excellent speaker. Excellent yeah. speaker. And very, uh, you know, I, I, I was learning quite a bit from him. So I was... Uh, uh, pleased to see him on. He did the first Astronomical League Live uh, program 22 episodes ago. So, you know, so I'm really glad to see you guys keeping this up. It's awesome. It's awesome. Okay, so um, we are going next to uh, David Iker. Now, Dave has uh, already gone through his crystals and minerals and uh, he claims to have gone through his uh, meteorite collection already. And so now he is about to um, uh, start on his uh, collection of favorite deep sky objects, I believe. Um, so, and I think there's a lot of them. <laughs> I think I've okay. exhausted, Scott, much. the, the minerals and meteorites for the moment, uh, for the time being. I think it was about a year and a half of talking about minerals there. We so all, a lot. All, we, all. we did. I mean, I did, you know, so I think it's very cool. You know, and, and it, help, it reminds you that the universe doesn't stop at just looking at the sky or thinking about what's up there or out there or whatever, you know, so it's, it's right before us. It's everywhere. It's planetary geology, and as my old boss, Richard Berry, used to say, Earth is a planet, too. Right. That's yeah, right. So. Okay. But, but I've exhausted that for the moment, and so I'm thinking I'll go into a new thing, back to some pure astronomy and looking at some interesting objects in the sky. And so I'm starting a feature tonight called Dave's Exotic Sky Objects. And uh, I have a list here of going through some resources and have come up with a list of interesting objects to talk about. And I thought I would talk about an object uh, each 
time. And there are, at the, at the moment, the working list is 442 objects. So the bad news, Scott, is that, uh, oh, Scott's on the phone. Well, the bad news is that I can only talk about these for about eight and a half years um, to come. So I will start to share my screen and I will see if you can see what I am seeing here. And I will see if I can start a slideshow here. And can you see a piece of art uh, that portrays Cygnus X1? Yes. Okay, good. We're in business. So what I thought I would do today, this is just kind of looking through a lot of resources and star atlases and things like that, that have some interesting things on them. And, and so I thought I would look at some interesting regions. And this is partly inspired by the fact that for many years, and not so much anymore, because uh, astroimagers are more creative now, and there are a couple of them, like Adrian is online with us here, who's a very creative astroimager. But for many, many years, we got, you know, the thousandth image of M42, you know, through the mail or email to us. And, and what there, there are so many interesting and unusual and exotic things out there that few people are taking images of, of many of these things. So I thought I would look at some interesting objects that are largely off the beaten path uh, to some degree or, or uh, to, to greater or lesser degree. So to start this business, I, I just started at the very near the celestial North Pole, um, and I'm looking now at a molecular cloud region in Cepheus. And of course, a molecular cloud is an area that forms stars um, that that uh, in in which molecules can form like molecular hydrogen uh, has low temperatures and high densities and so the gravitational forces can outweigh the internal pressures um, of uh, of the star of the of the little regions of density and and stars can form. Of course, does anyone know how many stars form if we're talking about solar masses, say, in our galaxy per year? There's a lot. Yes, John knows. <laughs> Not many is the shocking answer. Three or four stellar solar masses worth of stars a year, and that's it, which, which astonishes a lot of people that it's such a small number in a great big galaxy that has several hundred billion stars. But, of course, the universe has an almost unimaginable amount of time which we don't have as humans quite so much. So the star formation goes, uh, of course, happens over an enormously long period. So anyway, this molecular cloud that's in Cepheus and it's kind of on the border with Cassiopeia, north of the bubble nebula, has a nice region of star formation that contains several nebulae. And one of them is NGC 7822. It's sometimes called the cosmic question mark or the flaming skull. Uh, and the associated Cedarblad 214, which is also in the Sharpless catalog, which has practically all large nebulae in it. So this complex of nebulosity uh, lies about 3,000 light years away, and it was studied in the sort of middle years of the 20th century by a couple of different people. One of them was Sven Cedarblad in Sweden, uh, and Stuart Sharpless with his exhaustive catalog of nebulae in, in the United States. It's pretty typical of a ruddy emission nebula. It's slowly collapsing and will slowly form a new generation of stars. There's an embedded uh, sort of a loose, uh, not very rich star cluster in it as well that we'll see in a minute here. And this is somewhat infrequently explored, this little area, uh, even by astroimagers. So first of all, we'll talk about the star clusters that are associated with the cosmic, cosmic question mark. One of them is Berkeley 59, which is a small cluster. It, it's in the nebular complex. It's, it's sort of scattered a little bit. It doesn't look very rich. And it's young. It's less than 2 million years old. It physically resembles the trapezium cluster in Orion in terms of the kinds of stars in it, not in a trapezium shape. It has a total mass of about a thousand solar masses, and, and it uh, was noted in this Berkeley catalog of open clusters that was worked on in the middle 20th century uh, in the Bay Area. NGC 7762 is on the western edge of the cloud, and it's a little north of there, 
of the center of all this nebulosity. It's an intermediate age cluster. It's just a little younger than two billion years old, um, and it's a little, it's slightly closer than the than the nebular complex as well. It's about twenty five hundred light years away. Uh, there's another very faint and very small open cluster as well that's called King 11, and the, the uh, astronomer Ivan King also in those middle years of the 1950s and 60s did a lot of work cataloging uh, more obscure open clusters. He was at Harvard and then he moved out also to Berkeley and was involved in the Berkeley catalog. Um, and it's a little bit older. It's about 3.6 billion years old, and it's a very small cluster, highly evolved. There's also a planetary nebula that has nothing to do with the stars or the nebulosity. Abel 1, the very first planetary in not his galaxy cluster catalog uh, that's more famous than, than this, but George Abel at UCLA, of course, also produced a catalog of planetary nebulae that are generally faint and very weird, strange uh, planetaries, and, and it's in the region as well. So this is, uh, forgive me, I didn't update this at the bottom. This is not the Canyon Diablo meteorite. Sorry about that. Um, it it may, may look like it. No, it doesn't. Okay, but this this is a section, this is called uh, too much to do last week and rushing to get your talk done. Sorry about this. Um, <laughs> but this is a little section actually of Ron Stoyan's Deep Sky Atlas, which is a fairly compact atlas, but magnificently detailed. It's a really good atlas with many, many uh, unusual deep sky objects in it. Um, and here we can see the region and, and sort of the center of this nebular complex is Cedarblad 214 here. You can see there's a little uh, icon for the associated open cluster and the top of this thing, which is a sort of a bright waft of emission nebulosity as well, is labeled here NGC 7822, which actually is an envelope of fainter stuff that goes over this whole area really here. And you can see the bright cluster uh, there and also this little tiny dim cluster uh, K11 there and the planetary up at the upper left there, uh, Abel 1. And there's some interesting double stars in the area as well and so on too. So here's a sort of a wide field uh, image that was released of the area from a NASA press release here. And, and that's kind of the middle of Cedarblad 214 there, the big blob of stuff on top the co you can see the cosmic question mark it gets the because there's this little circular area of nebulosity below as well and here's a really nice atom block image of the central area and this really shows it in fantastic uh, detail and and the open cluster is sort of uh, centered but scattered in the upper part of this image but centered in that kind of open area that's above center there and of course this is uh, mostly the nebulosity of Cedarblad 214 that we're seeing here and you can see this magnificent dark nebulosity winding through it as well and it's a pretty rich star field there in in the on the Cepheus Cassiopeia border here so it's a kind of an interesting and and neat uh, area to explore that not a lot of people go out and look at. So my things now, rather than talking at, at great, great length about chemistry and minerals, are going to be a little shorter now. Scott, I just want to feature one of these areas per time here. Um, but I also wanted to share a couple of upcoming things here that, that are coming up. Next year is the 50th anniversary of Astronomy Magazine. Uh, so we're excited about that. And we're going to do some special things for the anniversary year. The first of which is in the January issue, a very special theme on everything you ever wanted to know about comets, but were afraid to ask. And we're very honored to have the world famous Dr. David Levy has written a, an introduction that opens the entire issue uh, on everything about comets. David, I don't know if you wanna say anything about what your recollections of what you've said for that piece. He's not hearing me. He's not hearing me. Or he's muted. Can you hear me, Dave? You're muted. I think. Yes. <clears throat> um, I'm looking forward to that issue. And uh, <clears throat> it's very, very special. <clears throat> I've written a number of articles for astronomy. <clears throat> Excuse me. My voice is going away as I talk so warmly about Astronomy Magazine. 
But what I wanted to say is that I have enjoyed over many, many years writing articles for Astronomy Magazine. But I think my favorite one was besides a column that I wrote for a while with you. But my favorite one was when Richard was editor and I wrote a uh, article on the star Betelgeuse. Mm. And, uh, you know, I uh, really wasn't sure how to start it. So I started it with these four words, stars are people too. <laughs> I didn't hear anything from Richard for a while until I met him that year at Riverside. And Richard came up to me and he said, stars are people too. And I said, yeah. And he said several times, stars are people too. He said, I read the first sentence of your article, didn't read anything else of it, and I accepted it based on those four <laughs> words. And I've never forgotten that, David. Stars are people too, and I still believe that. That's so fantastic. You, what a story, David. <laughs> yeah. That is great. So this won't have so many stars in this issue, but it will have a whole lot of comets. Great comets, uh, you know, since uh, Kiyoseki the history and lore, of course, of comets and, and supernatural beliefs and so on. The Science of Comets, uh, written by Walt Harris there, one of your pals at the, the uh, University of Arizona in Tucson there, David, uh, and Observing Comets by Steve O'Meara and Imaging Them by Damian Peach and a whole lot of other things too. So it's, it's really a special issue that we're very happy with, we think. And then I just wanted to quickly remind you that my friend Michael Bakich and I have this book that is just out, A Child's Introduction to Space Exploration, published by Black Dog and Leventhal. And it is for relatively young kids, 8 to 12, uh, to get them excited about the new generation of space exploration, which, if we're lucky, is just about to start down in Florida. Hmm. So that is all I have. I will be a little less wordy, Scott, if you can believe that uh, <laughs> with these <laughs> with these deep sky object regions. I, I but I do have them. I do have 442 of them though. Yeah, well, I think it's awesome and um, you know, who better to uh, to go over all these deep sky objects than, than you. Now, something else I will call the audience's attention to, if you haven't paid attention, uh, almost every day David posts an astrophoto on his, uh, on his stories panel on his Facebook page. So uh, you're gonna see some great astrophotography, um, you know, and I think having this kind of commentary of uh, uh, these uh, individual deep sky objects, and then to be able to go back and look at some of David's favorite astro photographs, I think uh, it's a nice mix there. So, well, as someone who finally made the list, ah, <clears throat> yeah. with the, uh, right with with the that, wide that, field that I'll show that, later on tonight, is, is um, that to get a subscription but, to Astronomy Magazine where they have a nice gallery and. Uh, you know, yeah, so I, I have yet to beg David to add some of my stuff, but that's coming. Don't oh, absolutely. We but, will uh, definitely add it, Adrian. And your your sh wide field shot of the lunar eclipse of last week is a killer shot. If you, I hope you'll show that. That is that is going to be it. on the list for tonight for those of you that hang out. Uh, I am going to show that image. That's actually a backdrop on my computer. And one of the reasons it is a bit of an honor to be on that list because you've got giants, the likes of Damien Peach, which you mentioned, um, you know, these astro imagers have been doing this for a long time and they have their process down and they know what it is they're trying to present. They present the cosmos in not only a fantastic way but accurate as well and you every you i see it all the time brings a smile to my face to see um the new images that um are shared with uh david eicher and um you know there you, you're getting a slice of the cosmos and i notice in the images you pick you don't tend to pick overly processed or super fanciful images they get right to the point. The beauty is in the object itself. It's mm. not in the processing, how they do it, or, you know, 
that some of it, it takes these guys 40 some odd hours, a lot of data, a lot of integration in order to pull out some of the detail. So it's the, these are some fabulous images for a reason. And uh, so that's, you know, it, it's always nice to see those images as they come out. So, yeah, I will be sharing, I'll be sharing some of these images with you as my process improves. Um, Excellent. Yeah. Well, you're, you're right up there. And, and, and that that's sharing stuff, you know, Scott, thanks for mentioning that it's a little bit out of frustration, because there's so many great images being produced these days, there's way more than you can put in the magazine or on the magazine's website, yeah. every month, and people send these to me and want them shared. And that, that's why I'm just throwing them out there on social media. So, you know, I'm, I'm really proud to be sharing, you know, Adrian and Damien and, and everyone else and Tony Hallis and the whole rest mm -hmm. of that. Sure. They want to get this stuff out there and inspire other people to go out and view or to also shoot themselves. And, and it's a nice problem to have to have so many great astro images these days. It's not like the old days, Scott, when we were first doing this stuff. We're right. awash in so much great science in astronomy, as we talk about this golden age, but also in a golden age of astro imaging, thanks to the Adrians and Damians and such. And, yeah. and it's really a pleasure, Adrian, to, sh to share these with people. Yeah, and it comes from our own love of the night sky. When a visual astronomer tells you your image makes people want to go out and explore the night sky, now mm -hmm. you're on the right track. And that's over the years since GSP 54 and David sharing, telling um, telling me to share some of these images with Global Star Party, um, the the journey began to basic, basically I'm exploring my own love of the night sky and then begin to realize that um, even the moon behind me can be fascinating mm -hmm. at certain times of, at certain times of the year, certain times of the decade when all of a sudden, it goes blood red. So, um, so yeah, it's, it's not only it's an honor, but then it's also outreach. It's showing people, yes, this stuff is real and it's out there. Yeah. Well, and when you're inspiring so many other people with your images now, Adrian, I mean, you're, you're the, you know, it's, that's, that's a powerful thing you're doing. You're turning people on to the love of the universe. That's a big deal. That's right. And absolutely. I've seen my friend page real quick and then Scott turns to you. My friend page almost expecting me to post something, even if I think it's a failed image or not quite as good. I'm noticing more and more people, you know, asking about images or, you know, that it, it's becoming an expectation that I post something. So, mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it, it's, it's an honor. And yeah, I, I do plan the show some of the images i i would plan on showing not only older ones but the ones that i've done since in all the astro your best astrophotographer out there has gone through a journey of learning and many have been at it a little longer than me but it, it's all about getting a process down and knowing why you want to show the image it isn't necessarily i want the greatest image in the world you know, there are some that are out there doing it. Forget about that. It's your view of the cosmos comes through the way you process your images. Mm -hmm. And um, the targets you gave us tonight are some interesting targets. I have to watch this again and write those down so I can try and go after them uh, visually. If if I can get to a dark enough site, I have to see yeah. if I can see any of that those clusters visually. So Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very cool. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Adrian. All right. So we're going, um, we will go next to Nathan Helener Messelman. And uh, he, he blew me away uh, this week by uh, submitting, a, um, submitting a, a very nice film. Uh, apparently, he's done the music for this film. He did all the editing. He, did it, he put the whole thing together. Uh, I think it's very inspiring, but I'll let Nathan uh, describe uh, this this uh, the, his uh, new uh, film short, um, and I think that everybody should watch it because it is uh, it is just that it's very inspiring, and uh, it uh, I, I watched the I thought I would just watch like a couple of minutes to make sure I got the file over and everything. 
Um, but uh, I ended up watching it twice. So thank you, Nathan. And um, I'm going to turn it over to you, man. All right. I'm glad to be back on the Global Star Parties. Uh, it's great to see you all. And I think one of the main reasons that I created this film was the moment that I realized that the entire Apollo program happened within a decade. Like from John F. Kennedy's speech to the actual Apollo 11 landing was less than seven years. And this Artemis, which uh, Artemis 1 happens to be launching um, tonight, if all goes well, <laughs> uh, has been in development since, what is it, 2004? So it just got me thinking about how the space age suddenly became so political. And after the Cold War, it just kind of fizzled out. So I wanted to kind of create a film to reflect on that just as we enter this glorious next space age with Artemis and everything. And uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, in the film, um, just sort of the optimism that everyone's going to have, like now that we're actually taking that jump, going back to the moon. Um, and I think it's not going to stop this time. Like it might have fizzled out uh, with the uh, space race in the 1960s and 70s, but it's not going to stop this time because this is a different kind of space age. It's one that the entire world is doing together at the same time. And that's self-sustaining. So uh, without further ado, uh, Scott, if you would, um, yeah, I think we're good. All right. Let's uh, do this. And uh, and the title of this film is? Uh, this film is called Seeing Beyond. Great. And here we go. Two thousand and twenty-two. Now, finally, we're ready to head back to the moon. Our ambitions are higher than ever, but we're still just drifting out there. Where are we going to end up? Are we going to roam the cosmos for billions of years? What is going to happen once we finally take that giant leap into the universe? If we could land humans on the moon in the 1960s, what are we capable of achieving today? We are about to enter a new global space age and we are never going to turn back. In the coming centuries, Mars is truly just the beginning. What really is our full potential? We could eventually become a galactic civilization, maybe even intergalactic. But where do we even start? We are more connected on a planetary level than we've ever been before. The world is suddenly accessible to people. It's so easy to forget that we're all just floating out there on this fragile blue planet. But going beyond the Earth, it's more than just an adventure. It's about inspiring the population. And in fact, it's necessary for the long-term survival of our species. Unfortunately, rockets, once again, are not just being aimed at distant worlds, but between rivaling nations, divided by borders that don't even physically exist on a fragile planet. It's dangerous, the destructive power we've amassed out of conflict, the power to end our entire civilization in one single nuclear tempest. If we aren't careful, we might end the space age before it's even begun. However big you think the universe is, it is bigger than that. So far, we have reached one single planet out of an estimated 10 septillion worlds in the universe. How can we possibly stop with just that? What incredible sights await us out there? Billions of planets, each with their own mountains and skies and oceans, sunrises and sunsets of their own stars, their own moons, perhaps even alien life forms, all of which we may never know. Faced with the staggering amount of the universe we may never visit, it instills a sense of absolute insignificance. But we can't forget that we are part of it too. We are made of star stuff. We have existed for such a fleeting instant in the story of the universe, and yet, in that time, we've managed to understand it, 
understand our place in it, and we've reached it ourselves. We built a space station, we've been to the moon before, and now finally, we're going back. One day we will travel to other stars, most certainly not during our lifetimes, but one day people will. And whoever they are, they're actually depending on us this century to kickstart the next space age and take that jump into the universe. Even if we're headed for other stars, where exactly are we going to end up? In the end, there doesn't have to be any deep meaning to it. If for nothing more than to satisfy our curiosity, our urge to explore, why wouldn't we want to strive for intergalactic civilization? Even if there's no big purpose to it, why wouldn't we want to set foot on other worlds, travel to other stars, and become a meaningful part of the universe? And maybe one day, we'll be out there. We'll take that giant leap into the universe, and we'll never turn back. The fundamental rule in this universe is that everything ends. Stars burn out, planets disintegrate. Everything eventually dies. So let's hope that in the quadrillion or so years we have to prosper in this universe, we extend our reach as far as possible, traveling to other stars, other galaxies. Let's hope that by the time the last human is born, we have extended to the farthest corners of the cosmos. And let's hope that the end isn't here on Earth after some nuclear war but out there, in the most spectacular universe imaginable. We have the privilege of being alive in the universe's golden age. And once we return to the moon, we will not stop there. If we work together as a species, build on each other's ideas, and never stop exploring, the gateway to the universe is open. Scott, I think you're muted. You're right. <laughs> okay, good. Now you got to start all over, including oh, the wow. Everybody needed to hear that, so. <laughs> because it was uh, your pro. Uh, really, just an amazing um, production there, Nathan. So uh, I hope that uh, you share that a lot with other astronomy clubs and. Um, other programs so uh, it, because I will certainly be recommending that people uh, uh, have you on their uh, on their special um, programs where you can you can come in via zoom and do that because it, uh, really uh, I can tell there was a lot of work and um, really enjoy the music with it and uh, all the visualizations and stuff that you picked and edited are, are great so yeah, Thank you. I, um, I, I think the film was also an excuse to take the synthesizer out for a spin again. So, well, yeah, I, uh, I had I the uh, privilege of having a subwoofer with connected to my uh, computer sound. So the low notes that you use really resonate as a part of the uh, the music and the, the music you put behind it. Um, had it rattling the whole house. So very choice there. And definitely... I, I looked at that and it just instantly we were talking about pale blue dot. I think John, I think John Goss was here and this channels that spirit and updates it for 2022 and for, for the youth. Uh, it, it, it looks like it fits into that next level of, you know, if, if pale blue dot may be a bit too old for someone to watch, watch your video. They'll get the same gist of what um, what Carl Sagan was trying to say and what we all what we're all basically saying. There's more to life than just what's in front of our face here on Earth. 
And we do need to protect it because it's our only home right now until we learn to travel elsewhere. Yeah, I think so, uh, it would have enjoyed yeah, it. That's my that's my take on it. Um, yeah, I thought it was an excellent video. Thank you. Um, I'll put the uh, link down in the comments. Excellent. Yeah, and I'll share that for the for the audience. So, um, Nathan, is there anything else that you'd like to kind of uh, wrap up with here at this point, or um, not really? Except that I'm hoping to make a sequel sometime. Sometime, I don't know when. But other than that, um, yeah, thanks for thanks for letting me share that. Awesome. Okay. All right. That's great. All right. So uh, we are going to um, uh, see some uh, more videos. This is about, uh, this is a short series of videos uh, available, by the way, from NASA. You can also get, you can download these videos from NASA and ESA. Um, you know, I'm uh, often looking at uh, what they make available as far as a, um, you know, uh, something you can share on an educational level. And uh, so the, this is uh, this is three videos, short video shorts about Hubble and then one about uh, the James West Space Telescope. So here we go. When there was a possibility that this servicing mission might not happen, there was a huge outcry, not just from the scientists, but from the members of the public themselves, people who are not scientists. They are the ones who wrote letters and made phone calls and sent faxes to try to get that changed. Hubble has revolutionized our understanding of the cosmos, and they've given our children a much clearer and newer view than we had when we were children. But with this servicing mission, we're going to be expanding our vision even further, giving all of our children a bigger and more fascinating universe to grow and learn and wonder about. So if I had to think of three words that I would use to characterize the legacy of Hubble for all of us in the future, those words would be vision, hope, and triumph. You know, Hubble's not just a machine. It's more than the telescope and more than the cameras and the equipment. It's a vast network of people who conceived and built and operate and appreciate this incredible tool. It's the spacecraft builders, not only the scientists, but the engineers, the technicians, bureaucrats, politicians, and everybody who worked together to make Hubble a reality and to keep it a reality. They had to have vision. They had to have hope. And then ultimately, there was the triumph of seeing it come to fruition. Astronomers from all around this globe use the telescope. Scientists from everywhere have the hope of using this fabulous machine. It's a triumph of Hubble that it can probe all aspects of from the planets to the cosmos to galaxies to everything in between. Star formation, galaxy formation. The tools on Hubble have given us the vision needed to study this. But these images are transformed in our imaginations. And they have captured the imagination of kids all around the world. Ordinary people love Hubble. The Hubble story resonates with people because it's the story of humanity. It's a story of hope. It's the story of darkness. Darkness in which we eventually triumph. And 
Of course, the astronaut corps, not just the astronauts, but the support staff, the shuttle engineers, thousands of individuals who contributed in myriad ways to making this program a success. Their vision of a successful mission, hope of complete accomplishment, have led to many triumphs in the past servicing missions. The efforts of all of these people culminate in the Atlantis mission. The Hubble Space Telescope has already earned its place in history as a triumph of science in our modern era. Yet there is more to see, more to learn, more to ponder, and more to wonder at. This mission will give Hubble the tools for a marvelous swan song. One more opportunity to probe this vast universe and all that lies within it. As a scientist, as a longtime user of Hubble, as a public citizen, and as a parent, I'm going to be watching this final mission with hope for the future. I'll be marveling at the vision and triumph that Hubble represents, and I wish the shuttle crew a safe flight and a bon voyage. This interacting galaxy duo, called ARP-143, holds the distorted star-forming spiral galaxy NGC-2445 at the right, along with its less flashy companion, NGC-2444, at the left. Astronomers think both galaxies pass through each other, igniting the unique triangular-shaped firestorm of starbirth. Because NGC 2445 is rich in gas, the fuel of star formation, it holds thousands of infant stars. Yet, it hasn't escaped the gravitational clutches of its partner. The pair is waging a cosmic tug of war, and NGC 2444 appears to be winning. The galaxy has pulled gas from its companion, forming the oddball triangle of newly minted stars. By studying head-on galaxy collisions like this, we can better understand the origins and evolution of ringed star formation in galaxies.
So um, the first thing we needed to do is um, figure out where is the telescope pointing relative to the spacecraft. So we waited for the near infrared camera to get um, the temperatures cold enough um, so it could take images and did some evaluation of that. And once we were convinced that it could take images, we were really trying to determine if we pointed at a bright, isolated star, where is the telescope pointing? So we we picked a star that was very bright and didn't have any stars near it that would uh, contaminate the image. We know that the primary mirror segments aren't aligned yet, so we um, so they actually act like 18 separate telescopes, and we expect to see 18 separate images, one for each mirror, that are a little bit blurry at this point because we haven't aligned or focused anything. And so we pointed at a bright star, and we made a mosaic. We actually took the near-infrared camera and we took images in different parts of the sky. And then we looked for the 18 spots from the 18 different telescopes, if you will. And we were very excited to find them. They were actually very close to where we were pointing, um, well within uh, our expected size of where, where they might land. And the 18 spots were actually fairly close to each other as well. So really everything was very close to what was predicted and much better than what we consider to be the worst case um, pointing. So we were really excited about that. We also took a, a selfie of the primary mirror. We took an image of the primary mirror and that helps us understand the alignment of the telescope, especially the primary mirror, to the, ca the camera itself and the instruments. And um, initially that looked good as well. So, so far the data we have suggests that um, what we're seeing matches between our models and the actual data. We're just getting going, but um, we have now gotten some data looking through focus, and we've been able to see that we don't see any surprises in the shapes of the mirrors that we're looking at. So, so far so good, but we do have a long way to go. We've also now identified which of the 18 spots is which mirror, um, and we've done that through a special process that allows us to identify them. Um, and at this point, we even know which ones are from the wings. And uh, it turns out one of the wings, you can actually see those three spots are a little farther over. Um, and, and that's sort of what we expected. Um, so we've identified all 18 spots. And uh, the next step is to make an array of them. And then we're ready to start uh, what we call global alignment, which is when each of those 18 spots will start to be aligned and focused. And that's sort of the, the last step before we take those 18 spots and put them on top of each other to start forming a single star from the single star going through the 18 separate telescopes. And, uh, and that, that's the work that will be starting soon. What the selfie is, is there's actually a special lens in the near-infrared camera that you can put in, and it allows you to take a, a picture of the primary mirror itself. And in this particular case, one of the segments is pointing at a star. So that is the segment that lights up. But you can see the outline through the shadows of all 18 segments and you also can see the outline of what's inside of the instrument itself, and we can see how well that primary mirror and the telescope is aligned to the instrument. And that gives us some initial confidence that the alignment looks good, and that's a good starting point for doing the alignment of the telescope. The first uh, evaluation images uh, actually came in in the middle of the night, and that was just to determine whether the near-infrared camera was uh, working well enough for us to start the alignment and the near cam team, the near infrared camera team, and the telescope team got, got together the next morning and looked at the data and um, everybody was you know, happy that the, the camera was working well enough. Uh, so then we you know, pointed the telescope at this bright isolated star and um, we started taking the mosaic where we would look at these different places in the sky. And um, when we pointed the near cam at one particular point pretty early on, we saw nine of the segments in that one image, um, and everybody basically broke into cheer because we were so happy. Um, it meant that we had basically had figured out where the telescope was pointing, things were wor working right, and even the spots themselves looked like what we had modeled and what we had expected. So there, there was, you know, people were very happy about that. Uh, and then we've also been evaluating the data as we go. We did this thing called a focus sweep where we looked at the images through focus, and we've been evaluating those in detail. And at this point, as well as we can evaluate them, things are matching our models. And so there is a feeling uh, right now that uh, things are consistent with what we predicted they would be and, and, predict and what the model said they should be. And uh, that's all you can ask for as you start a, start a process like this.
One of the great um, spin-offs from the James Webb Space Telescope was when we were developing the mirrors, we um, actually developed a technology. We, we, we funded a small company to develop a technology that could measure the mirrors at an earlier state. Uh, it's a device that was called a scanning shack Hartman sensor, um, which is a complicated way of being able, saying that you build something that can measure a mirror that has a lot of uh, curvature early on while you're initially grinding and polishing the mirror. But that uh, company actually got bought by a larger biomedical company um, in order to use this sensor as part of a system that can do LASIK eye surgery. It has the ability to measure astigmatism in the eye, and so it became part of a biomedical, a larger biomedical company. But the investment in the technology that we did for James Webb le led directly to that technology then being part of this future spinoff. Um, yeah, I actually um, am legally blind in my left eye. It's one of the reasons I got involved in optics. Um, I have like 2,500 vision in one eye, and as I was growing up, I was always very interested in understanding how I could do depth perception and how the eye worked and whether there was a way that I could, uh, you know, do something to help my eye. And so it just, it just got me interested in optics. It's one of the reasons I studied optics. Um, and there's definitely overlap between ophthalmology and, uh, and how you deal with eyes and, and how you deal with telescopes. Um, and one of the real interesting ones is you have a pupil in your eye. Well, in a telescope, the primary mirror is the pupil. That's the pupil of the system. They're related by optics. And uh, so we use a lot of similar things. And, and I'm kind of, I feel like I've kind of gone back to the original reason I got interested in optics and thinking about you know, how it relates to the eye. Okay, well guys, we're gonna take a uh, uh, 10 or 12 minute break here and then we'll be back um, with uh, more speakers. And uh, so now's a good time to go get that sandwich or that cup of coffee and we'll be back with more. Uh, well, I think I might head off now, but that backdrop, I really, really should, um, I could use that in my next film, actually. <laughs> <laughs> very, very cosmic. Very cosmic, huh? Yep. I forget exactly where I got it from, but um, there are a number of these things that you can download uh, from, um, you know, video clip sites and stuff like that, so... Nathan, well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's yeah. great to be back. Look forward to having you next time. Thanks. Awesome. All right. See you guys. See you, Nathan. Good work. Thank you.
Well, all of you out there watching the stream have 25 seconds to post something and get famous. Well, everybody, thank you for letting us have that little break. Uh, uh, I'm excited, just like you guys are, about seeing the Artemis uh, launch tonight. Uh, you know, let's keep our fingers crossed for, you know, a, uh, a, an earlier uh, launch window uh, or towards the earlier part of the launch window rather than later. So, um, but uh, up next is uh, Nicholas Arias. He is uh, known as Nico the Hammer uh, because he's a, he's a gifted drummer. Um, and um, you know, one of these days I'm going to have to have you play some uh, live drums, Nico. It'll be awesome. Uh, <laughs> but uh, Nico happens to be an incredibly gifted astrophotographer. And um, the thing I really admire about Nico is that uh, he, like some of his friends, have been able to produce extremely fine images, even science images, with modest equipment. And, uh, you know, there are a lot of people who spend big bucks getting what these guys uh, produce, and it uh, really boils down to their own skills. So, Nico, thanks for coming on to Global Star Party with us. Thank you, Scott. How are you? How are you guys? Great. I am really happy to, to be back in the CSP was a, a few weeks that I I was complicated with the with Tuesdays but I I made the arrangements to be here tonight. So it's it's really nice to see you. And as you say Scott, we hope that Artemis finally launched tonight. Uh, I can't promise to be awake because it's <laughs> gonna be at 3 a.m here but <laughs> that's what I'm doing. So you know yeah we'll we'll try. We set an alarm and hope to wake up. Right, right. Okay. I hope you do see it. Let me share my screen. Okay. Can you see it? Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, I will start with this. Uh, finally, one day the my Dobson started walking. I finally decided to, to make a, a go-to system for, for get tracking in my, in my Dobsonian. You know, I, I always uh, made a planetary machine or some astrometry or photometry with my, my making a, a hand tracking. But I finally found a, a system that is really uh, simple because I I didn't want to to modify the the original mount more than a few uh, screws so I, I found this system all printed in 
in a 3D printer. And uh, we make uh, we, with a, a friend that knows a lot of uh, electronics, make a peak go to system that can communicate with two motor drives and uh, use this 3D printed uh, parts and it's working great. Uh, I, I need to, to fix some, some things, but it's, it's working fine. The, the go-to system works fine and the, the, track, the tracking for planetary imaging is amazing. Uh, I can now, uh, I, I was throwing away a lot of uh, dark frames or moving frames and it's, it was a really hard work to be 10 or 15 minutes moving the Dobbs onion while recording. And this was a really nice solution. You can see the, the altitude uh, drive here and the azimuth drive here. In the azimuth, I need to make a, a reduction to, to correct some backlash, but it's working great. Uh, here is a, a screenshot of uh, how I work with the Pico2 server. Uh, and Cartes to CL to synchronize and, and, and drag. And I have here a, a short video that I, uh, I captured with my cell phone on the laptop screen, where you can see the at uh, 600 magnification that this is the, the, the backlash move I, I want to correct in the azimuth, but it's amazing. To, to do planetary with the, with the tracking system. I am so happy. Uh, I had, haven't uh, nights with wood or really good seeing, but uh, I was still practicing and uh, I get this image the last, uh, last week of Jupiter with, uh, you can see here Ganymede, Ganymede shadow and uh, Europa just a, a little dot there and it's, it's really it was really a nice uh, improvement uh, as i always say you, you can do a lot of things even with your hand dragging systems with adopsonian with any other telescope but uh, in this case at uh, this uh, magnification have the tracking system is amazing and you can you can do it with a really low cost uh, was almost a, a home you, you can do it in your home if you you, you can download the, the all the tutorials to make the electronics and only need to to buy a, a, a few things this is an, another test on the on daylight with a sunspot and um, the same I, I won with the tracking system uh, I, I can use all the frames of the of the videos I, I capture and you can see some some details on thin details that uh, making with the hand tracking was really hard because I lost all the the peripheral information uh, well, was a, a really nice improvement. And talking about the new lights, can you recognize this? This is scope, Scott. I get my my first explore scientific scope. Uh, I was uh, visiting Caesar, and I get my my first light, uh, apochromatic, uh, because I I am starting uh, to to go to my kids' school and show the kids the moon. And it's, it's a really nice scope, uh, comfortable for the child. And even you can see here a, a, a live view picture that I take uh, of uh, 47 to Canae with okay. the, the SP, uh, SP Bonnie camera. And it's only two second exposure in a live view of 30 seconds. Uh, it's really, really nice, this little scope. Uh, you can do even astrophotography. Uh, so great, great work, Scott. <laughs>
a great photographer too. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, well, uh, today I, I was uh, to to my uh, my son kindergarten. They are four years old kids, and I was talking about the the planets, and the kids ask me a lot of things, and I I bring the this scope to show the kids that never see a telescope how a telescope is because we are planning to to make some daylight observation of the moon and it's really nice to to work with kids and, and to show and to they they were so excited so it was a a really nice morning and well i will show you when when we make the the event uh, with the moon, I will I will bring some pictures of the the kids and the school. Uh, it was was a, a really nice first experience teaching kids about astronomy. Uh, and it was really hard to to think uh, what to talk about because they are they are kids, uh, but uh, they are amazing. They they ask about the planets and they know every planet's name and was a beautiful experience that I am I am really happy so well this this was my my, my news and my latest works and I will continue to uh, learning to to get the best result with the tracking system in my job and it's, it's a really new world uh, but I, I am think that is a is a big uh, a big step. Yeah, actually, how long did it take for you to put the whole system together? Oh, was was really simple. Let me show again the the picture because sure. it was uh, maybe twenty screws at most. Because uh, you can see here we have two screws for the motor drive of altitude. Mm -hmm. This part has another four screws and the the bottom part is the same two screws for the motor uh, the holder and uh, here in the guides of the all the circumference yes i maybe eight or ten screw more but was maybe 15 minutes uh, assembling it's it's really simple i was I take a long time to, to pick what kind of motorization I want to make because I don't want to, to cut or modification the or make a big modification in the mount. And when I found this 3D model, I I, I said, is this what, what I need? Because you can adapt uh, in in the in the 3D software for the the size of your equipment and how do you, your equipment moves and it was really really simple to to mount this uh, maybe 15 minutes mm. and now i i need to hear uh, to continue to improving to get a, a really smooth uh, tracking but works really really great that's great yeah i see those those uh, big uh, gray gears on there were those also 3d printed or uh, the, you you see the the azimuth parts? Yes. It was um, there are seven parts that ensemble and you put uh, one after the other. And, okay. But yes, it's it's really you can do it in your home if you have a three D printer. I call my friend. I say I will send you files and print this. <laughs> it was one day printing and it was really fast. So the, it's all 3D printed, correct? It's all 3D printer except the the, the motors and the electronic. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So Tim, Tim Myers watching on YouTube, he says, "Did you have any preloading on the gears to remove the backlash?" backlash? He says it looked uh, amazing. Uh, no, I didn't have. Uh, you can program in the Pig Go to server has uh, a few parameters and I, uh, there is one that uh, is to compensate the, the backlash that uh, I was, I uh, I mean, this system, I, I don't know any other guy that mounted on the, my same scope. So 
is was um, I, I was trying different values in the backlash to make the, the correct uh, acceleration of the motor and it fits almost perfect. <laughs> I need to, to improve the reduction systems to, to make it uh, smooth, but it, it works great. Wonderful. Okay. Well, great. Uh, thanks again, uh, Nico. And, Thank uh, you, Scott. Yeah, I, will he I will be here. Okay. All right. Thanks. Okay. So um, uh, next up, we will, uh, we're going to stay down in Argentina, uh, where Nico lives, and go to uh, Maxi Falaris. Uh, uh, Ma Maxi's been on our program several times, uh, also an astrophotographer, and also someone who's done amazing work with uh, very little, with modest equipment and uh, turned out some amazing stuff. So, Maxi, uh, uh, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thanks. Thank you, Scott. Good night, everyone. Uh, well done, Nico, with that Dobsonian. <laughs> so, I, you, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm proud of you. <laughs> Welcome to the motors. <laughs> well, <laughs> um, uh, thank you for inviting me again. And uh, I, I, what I'm going to show you tonight is what I've been doing last week. Uh, because if you remember, I was with my uh, equipment outside. Well, me here in my home, but the equipment outside. I'm trying to do some uh, mosaics to uh, uh, to take a, in M42 and in the galaxy places. And uh, I was searching how to process that because this was my my first uh, step in that kind of uh, pictures. Uh, let me share my screen. Okay. So what we have here, um, I took pictures of M forty two and do uh, and I did a, a four um, blocks. A, a square for my sensor. So if you see this, this is a corner. The next one is like this. The another one. But the the software and when I well I, I use the CW as your plus and this uh, when you do the plan section uh, you can choose how much the the between the frame is going to put together uh, in uh, above of, uh, each other so when i did this uh, stack this for uh, uh, frames uh, it was taking uh, 10 frames of one minute uh, at gain 101. And then when I stuck that image, I have something like this. And you can see I use um, an H4, uh, for, um, for, sorry, uh, 8 uh, inches F4. And remember that one frame was practically like that. The another one was this part. The another one was this part. And the another one was this part. And this took me over almost 40 minutes only. Uh, it was almost systematized, systematized I think. And uh, if you see this uh, field of view, uh, when you zoom it, you don't lose details uh, with the with the nebulosity and the stars. And well, uh, this this only was a test. Uh, I was uh, I was really really happy uh, doing this. You can see some halos here in the brightening stars. That's why I use um, a IR. Uh, and UV pass filter. So this is the, the reflection that has this uh, filter. 
but anyway it looks really really nice um so i i have to get practicing i think in the edition uh, i have to see if i can do in the ngc uh, 1399 you can see there's a lot of galaxies in this place and the objective of this it was a uh, stack uh, nearby the ngc 30 1365 yeah this is a really good galaxy but this was also a two minutes picture and and in a pollution light pollution area here my sound but i have to see if i can do something uh, practicing and see what what's happened and you know the the, the time to process this for for in one image is really really hard because you have to give your time to uh, to wait how the the program does the process so prepare a coffee take a mate something and then if you don't like it you have to go back and try again mm. so but anyway it worth it it really really worth it it's, it's amazing, Maxi, because uh, if you didn't show us the, the four frames before, it's, it's a really smooth image. Uh, it's, it's amazing yeah. the, the, how, how it merged in, in the border. Yeah, that, that's something that uh, that does uh, picks inside when you do uh, the, the, the process. I think it was a mosaic merge or something like that, uh, that you can do the um, uh, uh, well be, uh, when you stack uh, between the the frames you will see the the line of the of the limit of one frame and each other but this process uh, makes some kind of a uh, shape to put out that and leave the the, the, the information uh, Anyway, this is only a a, a, a practicing, a, and I was trying to to do that. Uh, I think I, I don't know if I can see this one. No, this is going to be enormous. No, no it doesn't open it. Well, so um, uh, I last week I also create a new Instagram page uh, for myself. That, I, that is going to be dedicated uh, to astrophotography. I have my own one to where I maybe I will upload some pictures, but also my 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 private life, for, for example. But this is one I, I I don't want to mix too much because I I like to share the, in this case uh, everything about ast uh, astrophotography. So sorry, I, it was. Uh, in my Instagram page, it's going to. Uh, it's called uh, Astro hey. Astro Max. Okay, this is my Instagram page, and I did this uh, reprocessing of the Comet Leonard uh, taken at the beginning of the, this year in January, uh, because I. I didn't upload this picture uh, in the social media. So I work again with this image, try to see what I can do. And this was the the final image that I take, well, that I did. This is was a really, really good one comment. Uh, I hope that I can do I could do the the mosaic because the tail was really long, but anyway, uh, I have the the core, the the tail, the sodium tail, and these galaxies they are really far away, and uh, so I'm I'm really really glad to capture this and reprocess again this. So also what I want to show you is this is more like this is not mine 
uh, but uh, this is, I think it was a wallpaper that I searched in 2005 because I was this afternoon searching some old pictures uh, from school and everything. And I found this one. Uh, and this picture, I remember that I put it uh, on my cell phone, Motorola B360. Uh, it was the model. It was really, really old with, with this clap uh, or flip. And I remember that I put it on to, for a wallpaper. And, you know, at that time, I knew that I, I, I was wondering of this kind of pictures. And now I'm realizing that I'm doing this kind of pictures right now. So never is too late. Uh, if you uh, wanted sometimes the life and your uh, the, the the thing that you do is going to uh, put you on the way to to get to there so if you get in starting right now don't uh, uh, don't don't mess with yourself and also uh, if you are not starting and if you want to start, you know, I have to start some time. So uh, never is too late to start uh, in this mm -hmm. uh, amazing uh, hobby uh, and some kind of professional in some way. But I, I don't like to say never professional because you always uh, learn something with the passing days so well this is my little presentation for tonight i hope that you like it and well i hope to see you next week if i could thank you, thank you very much maxi beautiful images and uh always interesting uh thanks for coming on thank Great. you okay so um up next is uh, Cesar Brello. We head up to uh, to uh, Brazil, and uh, Cesar has recently been given a special award from the International Dark Sky Association, uh, which is uh, fantastic for all of his work that he's done to champion dark skies and be a defender of dark skies in, in Brazil. Um, so I think he's an inspiration to to all of us. Caesar, I'm going to have you come on. Thank you for being uh, a part of Global Star Party again. Uh, hi, Scott. Here is Marcelo. <laughs> oh, Marcelo. I'm sorry. It is. Marcelo. <laughs> Did I say Caesar? Wrong. Yeah. <laughs> I'm very Wrong sorry. Part of, uh, South no, no problem. You know what that reminds me of? Uh, you missed when the for, uh, universe contest. And they gave they gave the award to the wrong to the wrong person. <laughs> I did mean Marcello, and uh, it is a fantastic uh, job that he's doing um, uh, to protect dark skies, and well deserved. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. Nice to be with all of you uh, today. I, I we are near uh, tomorrow, man. Right? This night, I think, here in Brazil, that we happen to launch off the Artemis one. Then I, I remember when uh, Apollo astronauts was visited us here in Brazil. Let me share here my screen. Here is our group. Uh, yes. Let me see if we work. Uh, on a moment. Uh, Oh, yes, here is a one, a beautiful picture of Artemis with the moon mm. and the launch. I don't know the timing in the United States that will happen the launch because we have different time zones. You know? But here in Brazil, I think that they will begin to try 3 a.m. here in Brazil mm -hmm. uh, six, this night. 6 a.m. Uh, UTC, right? A 6 4 uh, UT, yes, universal time. Yeah, Eastern time is one oh one one oh four a.m. Yeah. I think that changes your time zone. You know, 
because mm. it, now it's three hours difference between us. You uh -huh. have a different time zone. Oh, yeah. Here it's it picture of Athens. And the, here is how you can compare the Saturn V and the SOS. Right? SOS, this is the block one that has 98 meters and the Saturn V almost 111 meters. And, but the SOS block two will have the same size of the Saturn V, almost 111 meters. That's a cargo rocket. And the, something that is fantastic is because the, the first launch of, oops, sorry, sorry. The first launch of uh, Saturn V was November 9, 1967. And the first launch, now you have delays, no? Then it will happen November 16th, 2022. And the diameter, the Apollo, the Saturn V had uh, almost 10 meters, and this has eight, eight meters and a half almost. But uh, the SOS is most powerful than the Saturn V, even it is a small, smaller. But it's not this that I want to let show. I, I want to show this image. Here is the launch of the yes, Apollo 11 mission, Saturn V, in uh, July 16, uh, 1969. And these are the crew, and everybody knows. Man. Here you have the Neil Armstrong, Michael Collins, and the Buzz Aldrin. But uh, here in Brazil, The first time Buzz Aldrin uh, made uh, a presentation was here in our city, 40 years later, when they celebrated 40 years of the launch of the Apollo 11. He visited our city, only 40 years. We had to wait 40 years, and wow. it was in our city, the first presentation that he made in Brazil. And here is Buzz Aldrin on the moon. And here is the announcement. Uh, This happened in this, uh, November 17, uh, 2009, here in our city. The, he visited us here. And here are the pictures when he arrived here in our city. Here is Buzz Alden, uh, his wife, me, and here is Marcos Pontes, the Brazilian astronaut. Mm -hmm. Here was the moment that they arrived in our city here, Campus Guaitacaz. We have a problem, uh, part of you know, the history was this. Uh, we got the resources to bring him to our city. But uh, one day before here, uh, we, we arrived in Brazil, we didn't have a fly to bring him from Rio de Janeiro to our city. I, then I asked help to my friends that has a radio, uh, had né, a radio program in the morning, the beginning of the morning. He said yeah. to me, come in my program and say what's happening. We are going to find a solution. Then I said in the, TV, in the radio program, Brazil Alden will arrive tomorrow, but we need a flight to bring him to campus. We don't have a flight to bring him to campus. Wow. <laughs> Then 15 minutes later, after the end of the program, I received a call. And I received a number of a phone, a phone number. And he said, this is the phone number of the former Ministry of Defense in Brazil. You call him now, he will find a flight to bring Buzz Alden to campus. And I made a call, and in two hours, we had a flight. Wow. That's from the Brazilian Army. A flight from the Brazilian Army, the Ministry of the Army. Brazilian Army, that uh, I was talking with him directly. Someone helped me. We are located 270 kilometers from the capital of our state, in the north region of states. And uh, they, they, someone knew the ministry that was responsible for the Audi Brazilian Army and sent to me the, his phone number. And I 
talk with him and he said to me, no problem, you will have a flight. And this is a, a Brazilian army uh, airplane that brought him to, to our seat. Here, when he arrived here, I, I hear the sound. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear. Yes. Can you hear me now, Spats? Yes. Yes, we can. It's a little bit better, Marcelo. Yeah, it is better. Okay. Because I need to change here. Only a moment. I'm trying to move here. Can you hear clear? Because the sound, I, I, I will show something that is fantastic. Only a moment that I need to change only one thing here. Ah, okay. I think that will work. Uh, I'm back here. Well, this is what happened when he arrived here at the airport. We have a lot of students there, and I, I hope you can listen what he said. Only a moment that we will open here the presentation. I hope so. That is a, a, a news, TV news. Uh, where is? Oh, sorry. Uh, it's not working. Only a moment. I'll try to open here. Well, what's happening? Ah, here. Let me see if you can listen. What Buzz Aldrin said when he arrived here. O astronauta norte-americano Buzz Aldrin, nesta terça-feira no município de Campos dos Goitacazes, interior do estado do Rio, para participar de um evento de comemoração dos 40 anos da missão Apollo 11. O astronauta foi recebido por estudantes de escolas públicas que fizeram uma apresentação musical. Perguntado sobre a visita ao Brasil, Aldrin disse que a recepção foi bem melhor do que pousar na Lua. Lá não tinha ninguém me esperando, brincou o astronauta. É um melhor bem-vindo do que quando nós chegamos na Lua. Ninguém estava lá. Astronauta brasileiro Marcos Pontes, que também vai participar... Isso aconteceu em 2009, em nossa cidade, em novembro. Isso é uma honra. He is the Brazilian astronaut that was a minister here of science and technology here in Brazil. And this was fantastic, it was a great experience here. It was a reception at the airport. Ah, here it was me. I have a lot of time. He, and he made two presentations here in Brazil, one for students, in this place, uh, you have many people there. Uh, you have a lot of students there. And what he said here, I don't know if it will be possible to listen. I'll try to put again. Ah, this was my TV program on the TV. Yeah. I had a TV program during nine years here in Brazil. A weekly TV program during nine years. Here is Buzz Aldrin there, but I will show here a short video about what he said. Uh, in a moment, uh, how I changed it. Thank you. It's a short video. Let me see if you can listen. Uh, as we in Apollo travel around the world, speaking to different countries after our flight. It's possible to listen. Yes. We can hear it. Yes, Marcel. Saying we did it, that we participated. And I think that is the spirit in which uh, America strives to do things for all mankind. Personally, I was able to be available primarily because of the education system that we had, that I had growing up, and am I taking good advantage of things that came along and, and volunteered and looked for new opportunities of, of learning new and different things. I chose early in, in life to serve my country through education at the military academy and from there to be 
become uh, a challenged uh, but exciting fighter pilot in, in combat in the Korean War. Uh, as I look back, I would not trade any of those experiences for anything. They built a camaraderie among my fellow people. When I went to a camp as a youngster, I learned how to get along with people, how to compete friendly. And I think the lessons that, that you learn now will be with you for the rest of your life to seek to be all that you can be in whatever your chosen profession. Not all of us can have the opportunity to go to the moon or to go to Mars, but, but there are challenges for each and every person throughout your life. So meet those challenges with honesty, integrity, and respect for those around you, for your teachers, and for your parents. These are the guides to your life in the universe and will make your life successful and happy. And uh, very good luck to all of you. Excellent. Excellent, Marcello. Thank you for, for sharing that. This was fantastic for us. It was the first time he made a presentation. During the night, he made this presentation in this, the big theater of our city that you know here, no? the mm. Trianon Theater. Yeah. He made the presentation here. It was the first time he made a presentation here in Brazil. He has the open ceremony of the at night. Here, uh, our group with him you know, mm -hmm. outside the field. Very nice. And here, me with him and the Brazilian astronaut. And uh, this year, in December uh, seven, was the la the last launch launch for the moon. Uh, the mission Apollo 17. Uh, mm -hmm. Then in December 19, they arrived on, they returned to Earth. And now this launch that you have in this night it, uh, is a return, the begin to return, the return to the moon. Uh, I hope soon we will be there again. We have uh, humans, humans on the moon again. And uh, this is what uh, we expect. This is the last mission to the moon, Apollo 17. Hmm. And they have a fantastic images that uh, I hope soon we can see these images again. Yeah. And here is something that's happening here. That is our, we have a, the sundial here in, in our university. And unfortunately, this was when it was built. 25 years ago, is a vertical sundial. And now the state of the sundial is this. They are destroying the sundial. We are doing a campaign to that they fix the sundial. They will have again the sundial there. Here is me there. This is my university. And this is how is the sundial. Is in the best place in the university, but they are destroying the sunlight. Unfortunately, yeah, that was built 25 years ago, and it was the first sunlight in our city here in Brazil. Yeah. This is unfortunately what happens here. Yeah. It's almost destroyed. Yeah. I think that if we not fix the problems soon. We lost. Tá, tá absolutamente abandonado. Esse é uma, uma vergonha para a universidade. Pura. Totally destroyed. Something very sad for us, but we are doing what's possible to that the university fix again the, the sunlight. And now we are preparing our new events. Next year, it will happen if everything works well. 
here. You don't have COVID and it's possible a uh, presential event. We are preparing our 50th international meeting here. That will happen in April 27, 29. You are invited, Scott, to be with us. All of you here will be very welcome here in Brazil. And we, uh, we hope it will be a moment to celebrate new times yes. and, and a new challenge that will appear. You know? can solve this new challenge. Yes. Thank you very much, Scott, for the invitation. Ever, it's a great pleasure to be here with you. you and all of you. Thank you very much. Yeah. And Marcello, I posted your uh, article in, on the uh, darksky.org website about uh, your efforts to protect our dark skies there. So, um, yeah, and uh, sorry for my uh, mistake. <laughs> we, we are Latins. I'm thinking, you know, a little ahead of myself. But anyways, thank you so much. And um, and uh, we'll see you hopefully next uh, Global Star Party. It will be a pleasure. I'll be here. Okay, thank you. All right, so... Um, uh, up next is uh, Dr. Daniel Barth. Uh, uh, Daniel is uh, famous on uh, our programming. He does a weekly program called How Do You Know, uh, where he shows, uh, you know, through simple uh, hands-on science, uh, you know, inexpensive hands-on science uh, activities, how you can figure out how, in, in fact, uh, like the uh, moon is round, for example, you know, so, um, but, uh, you know, a lot of us just take for granted uh, uh, the uh, scientific so-called facts out there, and we just kind of throw them out there, but, you know, how do you really know? But uh, Dr. Barth is always there to tell us, so, Daniel, thanks for coming on to Global Star Party. Hey, thanks, Scott, and uh, evening, everybody. Uh, fun evening here. Just uh, I logged on a little bit late. I was doing a planetarium show for a local elementary school uh, in Bentonville, about an hour away from my house. <clears throat> and uh, I do about 20 of these a year, and they're, they're loads of fun. And um, it's really great to get children into an inflatable planetarium, and we're showing them the constellations and things, and we're like, hey, who had fun tonight? and uh, lots of cheers. And uh, I tell them, remember not to tell your teacher that I'm funnier than she is and don't tell your teacher that you had more fun in my planetarium than you do in her class. And the kids all laugh and they think that's great, but uh, lots of fun and hurried home so I could be here with you guys. And I, I love the topic. I don't, I don't always uh, present on Global Star Party. <laughs> Something of a challenge for me because uh, it's an evening program and my day starts at 5.30 a.m. And I get up for early morning classes and all that sort of stuff. But I saw the topic this week, uh, looking at new light. And I said, Scott, it's just got to do, I got to join. I got to do this this week because there's such exciting things. You think about when we take our telescopes out when we take our binoculars out, and we look out into space, what we're really doing is we're looking out away from the sun. You think about the earth rotating, and as it carries us around across the Terminator, and we're now looking at the night sky, the night sky is by definition away from the sun. And uh, I once had a university administrator ask me why I had to do all my labs at night. And I equipped that there was only one star during the day and it got kind of boring after a while. We needed to see more stuff. But if you wanna see more stuff, you look away from the sun. <clears throat> Interestingly, the folks at Cerro Tololo uh, Observatory, they're using a dark energy camera. They're hunting for dark energy, and they're using this really uh, highly sensitive wide field camera. And they're using this to look for dark energy, but they're also using it for other things. <clears throat> and what they're trying to do now is instead of looking at the sky away from the sun, they're trying to look at the sky toward the sun. Not during the daytime. What they're doing is they're hunting asteroids that orbit and cross the Earth's orbit or orbit inside the Earth's orbit. We know about inferior planets, Mercury and Venus, and superior planets, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, and the rest of the boys in the band. 
Well, let me submit that an inferior asteroid would be something that orbited closer to the sun than we are. How do you find these things? And how many big ones are out there? Because we often hear, we often hear people say, oh, no, no, we, we know all the dangerous ones. And we, we know 95% of what's out there. We're just, we're just tucking in the corners and nailing down the edges. Well, the Cerro Cholelo folks with the dark sky cam, it's particularly suited for asteroid hunting because not only is it highly sensitive, but it's very wide field. Uh, if you're going to hunt for an asteroid, you need something wide field because if you're trying to look high magnification, narrow field of view, you're going to have a lot of searching to do. So they turned the dark energy camera and they said, ooh, ooh, we have about a 10 minute window. Imagine friends, if your window for observing is 10 minutes a day, once at dawn, once at dusk, you get 10 minutes, that's it, because <laughs> At night, either at, you have 10 minutes when you can look close to the sun and then the earth rotates, carries you across the terminator, and you can't see that part of the sky anymore. During the day, pre-dawn, you get 10 more minutes, and then you have to close the shutter because the sun's coming up and it's going to blind your camera and fry your instruments. So they've got just 10 minutes a day morning and 10 minutes a day evening, and that's the whole thing. And they've been looking, and yes, lo and behold, they found asteroids. And you say, oh, little tiny asteroids that make little meteor showers? No, they found one and a half kilometer killers. Now, we all know about the famous Chicxulub impact, and I hope I'm saying that correctly, friends. The Chicxulub impact uh, <laughs> 65 or 6 million years ago that wiped out the dinosaurs. I was pointing out to my students today, I was saying, we have to teach the controversy, but it's good to teach old controversy. We have to teach science as a process that's not perfect. And we have to remind our students the way Galileo reminded the Pope, don't link your beliefs with your science because beliefs should be forever and science is always changing. But we don't teach science that way. We say, oh, oh, we have this, these great discoveries from these great people, Newton, Galileo, Copernicus, and we teach them as if they're carved on stone tablets and they came down the mountain, and that's not the way science works. I was reminding my students, I said, if you get to be old enough and you pay enough attention, you'll find that there's a whole lot of stuff you used to know which isn't true anymore. The title of my lecture was, This Used to Be True. Hmm. And the idea was, oh, we know where all the really big asteroids are. No, we just spotted a one and a half kilometer killer. Now, the dinosaur killer was about seven to 10 kilometers. This thing, this new one and a half kilometer asteroid, it crosses the Earth's orbit regularly. You think about that. A one and a half kilometer monster that crosses the Earth's orbit regularly. What would the impact be like? One and a half million megatons. Ugh. Yeah, you think about this and you're like, oh, well, that will scotch the weather depending on where it lands. That will scotch the, uh, the weather in an entire hemisphere. You're talking extinction level event for lots and lots of species. You're talking about, oh, if you bullseye, and we, we did this on my program and we got the Purdue Impact Simulator. And we said, okay, one and a half kilometer wide asteroid and let's have it land in Arkansas. And uh, it was about 50 miles away from my home, but I was inside the outer crater and we realized the blast effects and the ejecta pattern covers North America. We're like, wow, this is really horrible. And uh, every time somebody says, oh, we know them all. I'm like, you know, you need to be prepared to look with new eyes and new places with new light in order to see these new things we make assumptions and we as teachers are guilty of this we make assumptions and we teach science as if it's settled and you hear people say things like 97 percent of scientists agree eh, science isn't about polls friends all right <laughs> in the time of in the lifetime of galileo <clears throat> I, if you asked who believes in the sun-centered solar system 
it would have been what a, a couple of dozen very reluctant hands raised the rest of the world said no 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 the earth is the center <clears throat> when we look with new eyes and new places with new light we find new things and anybody who says and there have been a number of times when scientists famous scientists have said oh well uh, physics is done now all future students and physicists are going to do is fiddle with the last couple of decimal places and they have been notoriously wrong <laughs> notoriously wrong and uh when we when we look at something like this and we go oh gee we're looking in a new place where we don't usually look in toward the sun and we find out oh gosh there's a one and a half kilometer wide asteroid and there were other very large asteroids out there how long did it take them to find this oh a few months they released this particular finding uh i think it was the 31st of october this year and they said oh by the way we found uh, several new asteroids. And uh, this one is 2022 AP7, is the great big monster. And then they found a, a 2021 LJ4 and 2021 PH27. Those are supposedly safe because they're orbiting completely inside the Earth's orbit, unless they get a gravitational kick from Venus or Mercury and get accelerated out and a little more elliptical orbit that maybe crosses the Earth's orbit. Um, we need to think and teach those who come to us that science is always changing, that it's never settled. And it's where we see these little discrepancies. Oh, wait, our theory agrees with everything. Yeah, that there's these couple little nagging details here, but we can just tweak the theory. Science, astronomy is a multi-millennia adventure where the little niggling details, the little tiny discrepancies were cracks through which, aha, we peered and we found out, oh, we don't need to tweak our theory. We need a new theory because it was the retrograde motion that puzzled Aristotle. And then Ptolemy came and said, I can save this theory. Look, we'll just add circles. He added five. And in a couple hundred years, we had 90 circles. And Copernicus said, oh, no, no, scrap all those darn circles. What we need is a new theory. Let's put the sun in the center. Einstein is famous because he was the first man, the only man in 350 years to make any correction whatsoever to Newton. And now we have, uh, <clears throat> we have scientists who are looking at Newtonian gravitation. And they're looking at the way, oh, galaxies don't rotate the way planetary systems do these little discrepancies these little cracks through which emerge new visions of science when we see with new eyes and new light because we look in new places we need to teach science as something that continues to change and this program is so important and scott gotta gotta really give your give a hand to you because this program is so important give my hand to everybody else out there because it is this group of speakers that makes, and the audience that uh, makes Global Star Party. It's awesome. So it is indeed. And, it has uh, life of its own. Very pleased to be a part of it. Keep looking up. <laughs> Don't always look in the same old places. Uh, you may just find something new, something amazing. Right. And uh, hopefully we get to name it after you. And uh, it's not something that's going to wipe us all off the map. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> like a kilometer and a half asteroid, which would yeah, be that, like, that uh, would be, uh, yeah. yeah. Let's, you let's you go from be... being famous to infamous. Yeah, infamous, right? So. Yeah. Let's let's hope it's not a uh, tuck your knees, head between your knees, and kiss your bottom goodbye. Yeah, so right. But uh, I just have to applaud the Sarotololo people for ooh, mm -hmm. if we have this teeny tiny window, let's look for things closer to the sun than us and it's something that as astronomers we never think of we right. like oh no we need to wait till astronomical twilight when the sky is good and dark when we can see fun things yeah. uh that it really yeah, is it's amazing out there in the glare that's right it's there in the glare exactly yeah anyway uh i'm off for the evening friends because my morning starts very early tomorrow yeah but it's been a joy to be here and uh scott and everybody else thank you very much Thanks, Daniel. Thank you. Okay, so we um, uh, we are running.
schedule, and I've asked Gary Palmer if he could step in for a few minutes. We haven't seen Gary in uh, quite a while, and uh, so it's it's good to uh, have him tune in and uh, to get reacquainted with uh, uh, this amazing astrophotographer. Gary, it's all yours, man. Thanks, Scott. Hi to everybody. Thanks for asking me to come on. Has been a while. Um, been busy. That's all I can say. Um, really, really busy at the moment. Uh, all sorts of things going on. So it was a little bit short notice to come on tonight. So I thought, well, what should we look at? Um, sun's getting quite busy at the moment. We've seen lots of different activity on that. So I thought we'd have a delve into that area um, for the moment. So I'm just going to move some screens around so I can start sharing mine. I'm going to bring up some stuff here. Give me two seconds. Just get it prepped. And there we go. Hopefully you can see that. Okay. Yep. We so, see <clears throat> the four wavelengths you shot the sun with. Yeah. Um, so what I've been doing um, really over the last year is, is working on a unit that I, I had on one of the star parties, the uh, solar rotating. And the idea behind this is switching between the different wavelengths that are available um, to look at the sun. Um, what we're doing with this unit now, we've got one in Spain and there's one here. Um, they are actually uh, going to start um, being retailed soon, really over the next month. Um, all of the testing work's been done. Everything seems to work well. But the idea behind this is if you have separate um, telescopes, separate uh, filters, and you're changing these around, you're switching around, it's really, really hard to get the different wavelengths aligned. And this was the idea behind the unit, was to uh, keep all of the wavelengths aligned perfectly. We can go back to them uh, time and time again. And the difference is now is really with cameras. It's changing the camera now. Now, these are all mosaics. So that's what makes this a little bit different. And I thought we'd have a look at how we're doing those now, because we've automated some of this. Um, not all of it. Um, some of that we're still working on. And uh, the system we've got running in Spain, that's um, really the thing we're playing around with to try and get this all up and running together. So first off is really how we are getting these uh, together. So. There's a piece of software, a free piece of software called Planetary System Stacker. Um, if you've got lots of images, <coughs> excuse me a second, if you've got lots of images, it's a really, really easy way of automating part of the process. And that's the stacking of the SER files. All you need to do is open this up. So we just go up to the file. Hopefully it'll work in a second. Right. Let me just go there because I've probably already done this. Right, try again. Open up where you've got the images. So these are from, some, from today, just for example. So we would select some of these, however many you want. Open them up. Once they're open, if you go to automatic here, it will more or less do all of this off the cuff. So you don't have to worry about doing any settings. And away it would go. Um, it's going to start working on all of these once you hit the start button. Now, I'm not going to run that now because it's going to go over what I'm sort of trying to do and, and use up a lot of the resources. But one of the biggest problems with a lot of the systems is you've actually got to sit there and manually do this. Um, when you've got a lot of data uh, coming in, and to give you some idea now, the systems here in an hour, we can eclipse 400 gigabyte of data. So that's a lot to sit there and work with. And I just found that I wasn't getting the images out in a day. You know, 10 years ago, our cameras were really small. You used to take a bunch of images and I'd have them out by lunchtime. Now they're taking forever to process just because of the size of the files. Mm. But once this has run through it, you end up with these all in your folders. Um, you can go off and sharpen these. So I'm just going to bring a folder on. You would have these come into your folders. You can go off and sharpen them in Registax. 
um, as a single image. If you're doing mosaics, quite often it works out better sharpening them afterwards. But this is one of the data sets. If we bring up Photoshop again, you'll see these different images, sodium, magnesium, calcium. And then we're going to start bringing these images in to do the mosaic. Now, some people will say, well, why use Photoshop? You can use Microsoft Ice. So, yeah, you can use Microsoft Ice. But Microsoft Ice, depending on what you're putting in there, um, will have a meltdown. That is the easiest way of putting it. It will start throwing images all over the place. So if I just open up a data set that I know doesn't work in here, we're just going to grab, grab all of these, drop them in. Give it a couple of seconds to work it out and there you'll see mm. it had a meltdown it's missing half the mosaic so now these are all symmetrical they're all dead flat in the way that they're captured running across the sun so when i generally capture i would always go from left side to right side and work across and then come back i do this manually there are some basic automated systems to do this but i never trust them um, that's the long and the short bit. Mosaics are a lot of work. In general, on a, any large mosaic, you would have to capture all of this data for the whole disk image in an hour. Anything over an hour, and you're going to get rotation between the top of the image and the bottom of the image. So this is one of the reasons why we don't use Microsoft Ice for this process. Back to Photoshop. If we go to Photoshop and you go to File, come down to scripts and load files into stack go to the folder i'm just going to select all of these and go okay and then we're going to attempt to automatically align the source images if it does it it's all good if not you're going to sit there manually putting these together mm -hmm. um, some of the big mosaics they can take 50 60 hours once you start moving over 100, 120 panels on the sun. Wow. So we click OK, let it run away. Now, one thing that you do have to do before you put these images in here is crop any stack lines off. If you don't crop the stack lines off of the single frames, you're going to end up with lines all over the images. And when we go to blend it, um, Photoshop doesn't like that. Microsoft Ice, you can get away with that. You don't need to, to crop the images, but as I say, it can't always align them. So it, it it's catch 22 on that, really. So we just give this a couple of seconds and it, it will run through what it's doing. So is this fairly new in Photoshop where it's doing a better job of it's been there a the lot mosaics. Of time, a lot of people don't know about it. Yeah, it, I've used it for years. What has got a lot better is the next sequence. Um, as you've got more and more updates in Photoshop, there's been things added. Um, and they've made our final result a lot better, is the easiest way of putting this. Yeah. Um, so I, yeah, I've seen you happen. stitch stuff together before. You did a four panel mosaic on the moon. And yeah. I watched you stitched it fairly quickly and and nailed so it. Just take a little bit longer. So if we just yeah. go back to the full image, there we go. So you'll see that there's slightly different intensities here, and that could be anything. It, it could be high clouds coming through. There's all sorts of issues. Mm -hmm. Generally in lunar, you don't see that. So you can use exactly the same process on lunar mosaics, and I quite often do just for a bit of fun. Once we've got these all here, if there's one that's really, really bright, then it's a good idea to adjust it. But if they're all fairly similar, and we'll try this now, um, we'll see how it goes. But if not, I would just go and select one of these panels, maybe that one there, for instance, and then just very slightly adjust the brightness on it. So we're just going to darken it up a little touch can you see what i mean so you're just adjusting that so it sort of matches in a little bit more with the panel next to it sensitive very sensitive because what it's going to do now is we can go to select all layers 
and then we can go to the edit menu and we can go down and go auto blend the layers. We do it in panorama mode and we also tick on this seamless tones and colors um, and content aware, full transparent areas. One of the biggest problems of doing solar mosaics, and this has always been a, a, a real bugbear, and it can happen with a lunar as well, is this dark area out here. It is a real pain to match. There mm. is no easy process. If this is slightly brighter on this side to the next panel next to it, there are all sorts of problems in getting this together afterwards. And you really have to go in here and mask all of the edge out and try and blend it. And over the years, it's caused lots of problems. This little area in Photoshop now it's been updated mm -hmm. just makes it so easy. So we're just going to click OK on that. And there we go. One full disc of the sun. You'll see how it's matched in the intensities on the edges. So we've got no sort of bright areas there. It's brought everything together. Now what we can do is, is just flatten the image. So if we right click on one of the um, one of the layers there, we just flatten the image and then deselect. And there's our solar image. Now all we've got to do is, is add color. And we would do this for each one. Um, so in this particular case, we go to mode, switch it into grayscale, and then go mode again and make sure it's 8-bit. To add the color in properly, it needs to be in 8-bit mode. If we go to mode again, then go to duotone, and then we would set up our color palette. So this one is pretty much um, okay for uh, Hydra and Alpha. Depends on your color choice. And remember, it's always down to you. And once we've got that, we would switch it into RGB mode. And then the world's your oyster. It's your choice on the colors. Go to color balance. And we would start adjusting the colors to what we want. And again, as I said, this is different for every single person. Let's just use that as an example. Mm -hmm. If you want to get the red out of the background, if you go to um, adjustments and contrast and then select the legacy mode, that will drop down the background very slightly and then raise the intensity, make it brighter on the surface. And then what we can do is, is go down to adjustments and selected color. And under the red, adjust the black down. And then your blacks. Nice. Okay. So that would be one of them. Then we would go to our magnesium one. I've done all of the work on it. So we would just go to image mode, grayscale 8 bit. And then in our duotone, we would change the colors now. So now we were looking for a green. So we're just going to randomly pick something to start to turn it green. That will work quite well. And then we would go back in RGB mode mm -hmm. and your color balance and adjust it accordingly. Now it's quite hard with green. A lot of people don't like a green sun. It, it's, they're not used to seeing the sun in green. So therefore, um, it's not so easy on the eye, but you can play around with it quite a bit. And then same thing again with your sodium. That's very similar to your, um, very similar to your HA. So go into duotone, yeah, and maybe just go for a very slightly red color. Where are we? A little bit more, something like that. And then we would adjust this and so on. And that would be it. That would be how you do it. Mm -hmm. Other stuff that we're working on at the moment is something like uh, that. That's a full disk image all shot in one go. So that's a new double stack we're working on at the moment. That's going to go on top of this system. Um, and the idea of that is so that we can see any solar flares going off at any one time. 
and then try and automate the system to move into that solar flare. So there's actually three going on at once here. Yeah, um, what we can do is, is then get the system to home in the main system or maybe the solar flare there. Um, then if another one goes off over here, the problem is, is when you're looking through the main equipment and using higher resolution or larger telescopes, you miss 99% of what's going on on the sun. So there'd be, as it, in this case, yeah, two or three flares going off. And while you're looking at one of them, you're missing something that's even bigger on the other side of the sun. So this is the idea is, is to try and automate it. But this system is actually working quite well because we've got the prominences all in one go. And there's no mosaicing or anything on this little tiny flat bit there, but that could be anything like higher cloud. But you've also got the detail of all of the filaments and any of the active areas. So that's the sort of stuff we're really working on at the moment, um, getting that up and running and, and sort of working from there. So let me stop sharing. Excellent. Beautiful. Um, That's excellent work. I guess yeah, if it's uh, going to be cloudy, shoot <laughs> at the sun, you get more data. Yeah, uh, but we've got, you know, issues with um, all sorts of stuff. I mean, I was looking through data here and we had a really bad season sort of last winter season. We went from December to March without really getting any images here. Um, just to, due to poor weather. And we've had a fairly good year, and then we've hit the uh, winter season again, and now we've got exactly the same thing. We're starting to get a lot of cloud and a lot of storms come through. Um, and you're just picking off, you know, four or five hours here and there. So one of the projects that I've been working on at the moment is on the flying bat and the squid. That's been running since August, to give you some idea. Yeah, so every time the, it's clear, observatory is open. And that's using some of these new dual band filters. And it, it's showing the limits that are there with the filters. So we're, what we're saying now is, is on some of the CMOS cameras, you're getting to a set point where maybe 30 hours, 40 hours. And after that, it doesn't matter what you do, you're not actually adding anything to the image. Hmm. And that's showing up quite well now. And even if you, you sort of switch, so you might have a mix of images there, maybe five minutes and 10 minutes, you know, on different nights. Um, it doesn't make any difference. You hit a really a brick wall is the easiest way of putting it. Um, but you're not seeing it with all of the filters. So that's why it's taken since August. Yeah, because you're working on, you know, repeated data. So some of them is into, like I say, 50 hours. Some of the others are into sort of 20 hours. And it's seeing that the squid part of that only really comes out after about 25, 30 hours. And it's seeing whether they pull it out or whether they're winding these filters up too tight that they're not actually picking enough of that data up. So there's a lot of different projects we're working on at the moment, but a lot of them are time consuming. So um not a lot else is coming out great great i guess well, I'm, thank you uh, very much yeah I'm muted very much gary um no problem up next uh, excellent work um is caesar brollo is caesar with us here i thought i saw him earlier i did see him earlier I have a presentation ready if you want to. Uh, yeah, how about you know. if you go ahead and go on, Adrian? All right. Well, let me uh, put this phone down and I will let's see. I'll start slideshow. I've got a few screens here, so I'm going to share one. It'll be screen two. So when I saw my. Um, I saw the presentation I was asked to do. I saw that uh, I had blood moon. And so I said, okay. So I actually found a couple of um, images from Eclipse Past. And I decided to go ahead and just put it all together in a um, presentation. So 
This is my presentation, Blood Moon, when the alignment of the sun and the earth casts a new light on the moon. And these are affiliations that I'm with. I'm with University of Lowbrow Astronomers, um, the Astronomical League. Um, this is the RASC. And I'm also a member of Warren Astronomical Society, um, also in Michigan. So part of a few clubs. And Scott, I need to add the um, Explore Scientific uh the uh, Explorer Alliance tag on there somewhere. I need, I got to add that for uh, presentations. So let's see if this works. Here we go. GSP 74. Um, and I shared with the world these four images of me trying to capture the eclipse. The one in 2022 happened similarly. So the moon did the same sort of thing maybe from a different angle as, as i recall the moon disappeared from upper left in the northern hemisphere to mm -hmm. lower right and mm -hmm. we only got to 97 percent. so there was this little part of the moon that was um that was lit up that stayed lit until the uh moon until the moon emit or the moon moved out of shadow and then more of it began to show up so we never got to totality yeah but um, that kind of reddening effect and uh actually yeah. I find, uh, these shots where it shows uh, partial illumination i think are fascinating um because you see all these gradations on the moon yeah and i have another i think i do have another one of these coming up later um but i did a little bit of research just a little bit call me the common man astronomer here and i said you know we see the moon it has this reddish look um and it isn't necessarily during the eclipse um we get it low to the horizon and it carries kind of this similar reddish color now um I looked up this term, uh, Raleigh scattering, I believe is how it's, I think it's pronounced Raleigh and not Rayleigh. 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 Okay. I uh, being corrected is Raleigh. <laughs> is it Raleigh? You know, anyway, um, we just had a doctor come on and tell us, you yeah. know, science is always changing. So yeah. always be willing to learn, even as you're doing your presentation, but this scattering is what is responsible essentially for, the reddish um, view cast on the moon as it rises and as it sets. So these are these are rising moons. This is a rising last quarter, which you don't see as often unless you're up at three in the morning. Again, in, I think both hemispheres, if you want to be up to see the waning moons, they usually show up in the sky during the day. But close to the horizon they carry a similar color um and the, this is an interesting image here because you see the moon's a little above where the belt of venus is here as soon as it gets down here it assumes that color um this image there the moon is actually low on the horizon it's turning to that reddish orange color and as you notice in these images the milky way was visible that's going to come into play later as I go through the presentation. So, and if you've got smoke in your sky, like we did, I noted July of 2021, that cast a reddish hue on the moon as it got up in the sky. Um, this is maybe a couple of hours after moonrise. And we had, we um, had smoke in the sky and, now that I think of it, I think this was more than a couple hours after moonrise, because look at where Tycho sits. Tycho is generally your indicator for how high the moon is on a close-up. If it's to one side, it's rising. To the other side, it's setting. And near the middle, like this, it's actually high up in the sky. So, so no, and I was incorrect earlier. This is, the moon is up in the sky, and it's still red. So different things can turn the moon red. Um, 
I looked this up closely and it turns out the Raleigh scattering happens, but while the earth is in between the moon and the sun. So the light that's scattered from sunlight going around the earth's limb and then gets cast on the moon. It is Raleigh scattering, but it's also happening during an, an eclipse. So it's while it's a similar color, it's um it's still unique in that it happens um only when the um happens only when the earth is in between the sun and the moon to where the moon be looks like it's being eaten away and then the whole thing appears with this lower dimmer red color so it still gives a different look than your rising your rising moon still has sunlight a lot of sunlight on it and an eclipse moon does not have sunlight um it had well it has raleigh scattered light coming off of the limb of the earth so so it is not as bright as a rising moon or a setting moon near the horizon so gsp pass i forget which one it was I shared a few images that I had taken um, of the total lunar eclipse of 2019, zero degrees. And I remember the moon being near M44, the beehive cluster. And that was my first attempt at trying to capture what the sky looks like at an eclipse. You're going to recognize this constellation, Orion. You're going to see him a lot throughout the uh, remainder of this presentation because Orion tends to be around um, this time of year when the moon is being eclipsed. We had a lunar eclipse that I didn't include in here because I only had one image of it and that was the lunar eclipse that was near the uh, galactic core. It was in the summer sky and that's one eclipse I would have loved to have gotten. Uh, there's the beehive right there, M44, sitting next to this particular one in 2019. So we had 2021. As I told you, Orion seems to show up when you have, if you're going to have eclipses in the winter, Orion's going to dominate the sky and be somewhere near the moon. In this particular case, you may remember this eclipse was near the Pleiades. and. So then on my birthday, November 8, it's happening again. This is a not so sharp close up of the uh, eclipses it's taking place. And here we are, a little bit different camera equipment this time, and went to a dark area. And there's the same old Orion. This looks fairly similar to last year's. November eclipse, except this is about as this is about as uh, dark as the moon got, maybe a little darker. Um, it still isn't fully eclipsed here, but it's already dark enough at this site to start seeing the Milky Way and um, start seeing more stars. And you've got some sky glow. All of this is happening during the near the very beginning of astronomical twilight so the sky colors there there is some brightness there and there is some sky glow in this location so that's why i mentioned if you can get to a dark site if you if you're used to viewing your lunar eclipses um and you're used to viewing them from the backyard and you take the close-up pictures um Next lunar eclipse, 2025, try finding a dark sky park and looking at it because not only do you see the eclipse happen, but you watch all the stars of the sky come out. And if you're at a dark site, you watch the Milky Way appear. And even if you can't take pictures of it, just observe it. It's, it's actually a very beautiful sight. I looked at this moon in binoculars and was blown away by how it looked. Um, it was a beautiful sight. 
because not only do you see, and you're going to see a couple pictures here, not only do you see the moon and you see the stars that are around it, it's, it's a unique viewing experience of the moon. So here you go, stars and planets even. Um, that little dot's going to be, I'm going to point out what that little dot is in a minute. But that's this is one of the unique views that you try to get when you're imaging lunar eclipses, get the stars that are around it, because that's not something easy to do. We have a lot of great astro imagers who will take a normal full moon and they'll put a star field behind it and it looks wonderful. Well, a lunar eclipse gives you the opportunity to shoot both in real time. This is a single image. I've stretched the background to bring the stars out and i've dimmed a little bit to give the moon the appearance that it has in binoculars and this is the, the appearance the moon has to the eye you see some of these so there's uranus um you may may have recalled that uranus was near the moon well i made sure to um check out the stars match them to Sky Safari Pro and verified that I had indeed caught your, the disk of Uranus in this image. So you, there sometimes nearby planets will show up, even um, ice giants will show up if they're nearby. So this was, this was a very recent find in the images that I take. Take multiple images, take different kinds of images because you never know what you'll get. I had left this eclipse thinking, well, I didn't take a shot of the moon with Uranus. Come to find out when I look through my images, yes, I did. So that this image hasn't been shared online. It, it will probably get shared online pretty soon here, but uh, you all, the GSP, are the first to see this one because I figured out that I actually had it. So that was nice. Now, this image, um, you have the California Nebula. This time, I'm using a modified camera. Going back to, really quickly, I'll go back to this image. This one was taken with a non-modified camera. And I'm, for 30 seconds, I'm getting some of this data here. There's... There are, a couple, there are things online that suggest you don't need a modified camera to get this sort of data. You just stretch it with your processing. Um, my thought on it is this is also 30 seconds, and um, it's more prominent. And notice the white balance colors are very similar. If you can get your white balance correct with your modified camera, you get more of this light, this HA light, this spectrum, you get it easier um, than you do um, when you're using a stock camera. I believe an astro camera, if you were to rig it with a wide angle lens, you'd get this information you'd get this information astro cameras if i'm not mistaken um you know the chips in there the cameras are designed for full spectrum so and as fate would have it this is a meteor shooting straight through the california nebula and i've got these two as well darker sites you'll see more meteors as the event is happening there's your eclipsed moon So now, another really cool thing about this particular eclipse in 2022 mm -hmm. is that we watched the sky begin to brighten while the moon was yet still eclipsed. And um, this one, this was a non-tracked image. As you can see, the stars are streaks here. And I believe this may actually be, one of these may still be Uranus right here. But we have the moon and we have the way that the sky looked as I was shooting over here. One thing I would have liked to have done was make this a composite and sharpen this because your eye wants to make this in focus. Mm. Our eyes can switch between looking 
at something in the foreground and then looking at something in the um in the distance and it does it seamlessly and if i want to capture that i have to make that front the front part sharp this was this was sort of a last second hey let me try this and i focused on shooting at the moon um it's easy to take a couple of shots so that's something i would do you know in the uh in the future i also took some scenic shots and i as a title if you can't capture beautiful pictures just sit and observe it you know enjoy seeing it and you'll you'll have the memory of it for those of us that can capture these pictures we try and capture them in a way that mimics what you see maybe a little more than what you may notice you'll see a you'll see a more um, a larger version of this image this is a close-up this is the Osabo Os River and you can see the moon still has its reddish color this is near this is the last image I took it's near the end of the eclipse where a part of it is still in the earth's shadow later on the moon would um take on the reddish color due the due to Earth's atmosphere and more of the uh, sunlight hitting it rather than it being in the shadow. Hopefully some of you got that. This was my final shot before I called it quits. It was this uh, shot of the moon setting over the trees in the Osabo River. Nice. Um, a beautiful morning. Of course, sunrise is behind me. You'd think I'd go ahead and get sunrise. And in retrospect, I probably should have, but I was focused on the moon. So that's the direction I shot in. And this is the image that um, David Iker shared on his feed. Um, it didn't, it wasn't the one with the meteor, but the, each of these was a, it was two minutes for the sky, two minutes for the ground and a couple of seconds for the, uh, eclipsed moon blended into into a composite and i thought it turned out really well gave you an idea of what the sky was like um and what the scenery is like so for an epilogue here i actually wanted to shoot the eclipse here but the forecast was for clouds kind of like what i was seeing a couple days before i came hiking out so the eclipse moon would have been here. I may have tried to redo this whole panorama, but I decided to go further north on the day of because the forecast for this location was clouds. So sometimes you have to have more than one location picked if you're gonna go out and try and get images of the moon. Here are a couple of images from the campsite that I chose with the Alcona pond right here. This was a winter shot with light pillars. And here's- That is beautiful. Yeah, this one. Um, it's like some sort of heavenly uh, Roman columns or something, you know? Yeah, everyone here. Now, everyone here, it looks like everyone here in this distant town is being called into the heavens. But <laughs> actually that's the light being, uh, shaped in the light pillars sure. from all the different lights man-made lights in the town i see and that's the pond that i shot that um image from the that boat dock that you saw is behind me and to the right i actually ventured onto the ice for that shot and as in most of my winter shots orion tends to make an appearance there, there he is again um, the full image of that has like the full constellation. And then as uh, summer's turning into fall, I captured this image in between the clouds. You had the uh, vestiges of the summer Milky Way setting in the uh, in the uh, pond. Well, yeah, they call it a pond, but I've seen bodies of water called lakes as big as this pond. Um, Bortle 3 and Bortle 4 skies here. When I go back, I'll get my SQML reader, which I just got. 
and I will be more than happy to get a good reading on a good dark night sky and see what's really going on here. I think the numbers are going to shade more towards Bortle 3. It is a nice darkness. The middle northern part of the uh, lower peninsula of Michigan. And so that's it for my presentations. My big thank you very much, man. Moon. Thank you. And you're welcome. But don't forget, the moon will be doing the eclipsing. So you've got your annual eclipse on yep. October 14th and the total solar eclipse April 8th, 24. That's right. So that's right. That's my presentation. Yep. It's awesome. Okay. Well, thank you. Beautiful shots once again. And Adrian, you never fail to inspire and, and enthrall people about the, you know, the amazing, beautiful night sky. So, with so often with clouds, yeah, yeah great stuff. Yep, just okay. keep on shooting. <laughs> keep on and, shooting. That's right. And now the anchor of the program has arrived, Cesar. Cesar, that's right. Cesar, how are yes, you? Can, can, hi, how are you? How are you, Adrian, Scott, and friends? I'm doing good. That was my birthday present to myself. Uh, it's a good it, birthday. It's a beer day. It's a beer day. Happy birthday, Adrian. Thank wow. you. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Uh, excellent present for everyone. Your big <laughs> uh, you now, Adrian? Lunar Eclipse was uh, are amazing. Um, really, I enjoyed the, the, the image. Uh, it was beautiful, really. Um, here tonight, I am uh, take, taking some pictures of Orion and Orion Nebula. Um, <clears throat> because it sounds funny that uh, the key of part of the rooftop of the building was broken it's unable to open the door to the south, uh, to the south is uh, part of the rooftop. Um, now we are going. Now we are in the in the part that uh, is for the north and west, and we choose Orion, that is not a uh, uh, south hemisphere object but uh, this is a beautiful it's the queen of the summer here and the queen of the winter of course in in northern hemisphere um it's a nebula that we enjoyed a lot uh in the catamarca star party uh, we enjoyed watching the uh, this area of uh, orion nebula like we we watched it with, like a picture uh, the nebula at uh, the naked eye. Um, we enjoy the flame nebula, and we per we perceive, uh, you know, the horse nebula that uh, to the naked eyes with some telescopes over uh, eleven inches, ten inches. Um, really, we was amazing. And uh, well, tonight. I, we are taking picture of, let me, first of all, um, I need to share the screen. Here I am with, with a routine that, okay, because it's, it's a great, <clears throat> it all, so we can share everything. Uh, yes. Well, here, here we have, we have. Okay, maybe we we move the picture one minute. <laughs> Orion, this is guys. <laughs> an individual picture. Here's one minute. Yeah, we also. can see it. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. That is how Ryan try. looks I, I... at Oki Text. Yeah. <laughs> ah. sure. Well, here the guy then he says. It's a little terrible, um, but uh, let me show you. We can try take a picture. Cesar, I've always known you to image, no matter how bad the conditions are for your tracking. You will never give uh, up. Oh yes, but we can take a, another picture. 
let me we can try 30 minutes 30 seconds sorry that's 30 minutes uh well here you can see uh no okay I, I tried to show you the the trapezium, but don't give don't give me the possibility the software uh, while take the picture uh, to show. I can. Let me let me uh, yeah. You can try a picture of thirty seconds. Okay. <laughs> There you go. Okay, here here is is the the, the nebula uh, from the city. You know, uh, it's it's great. When here you can you can hear the noise of the airplane from the airport. Right. But you know you know this is astronomy in middle of the city. No. Um, it it's it's the it's in a thirty seven floor. Uh, at maybe 100 meters, 120 meters of, over the sea level. Um, well, we we are we are making pictures that I can show you next week of of uh, Orion Nebula to start the, the summer <laughs> the summer time here mm -hmm. uh, to to make. Uh, um, a, a, um, you know, a, a picture of of a nebula that is is really the the queen of the night in summer here. And we, I think that we can make a beautiful image because it's great the optics, the focus, and maybe the scene is is okay too. Here you can see maybe something that we call it bands or kind of bands banding, banding. and of course that later we can. We can try to process something, maybe I would think and process something with the fixed inside. And um, but it's it's a beautiful nebula that we can we can try uh, next week to uh, with a smaller telescope, maybe with an entry level telescope, we can make some some uh, tricks uh, with a, a, a smaller camera, not a reflex camera. Uh, well. We can we can make a lot of, uh, of different things, and uh, when we we will be having the, the, the another part of the rules um, of uh, in watching to the south, uh, we can we can make a picture of Tarantula Nebula. That was my idea originally, but we can open the door <laughs> and uh, for the another side of the rooftop. And this size of telescope is impossible to use in my balcony. And really, I need to go here to come here to because uh, I need uh, more space. Eight inches in a, a Richie Gretier telescope, of course, that need, I need some space and it's impossible from my balcony. Um, let me check if I can try another picture. The funny thing about this night is that. Um, we did all the all the go to setting, all the setup and the, the polar alignment with only the stars of the Orion constellation. Because yes. like we only used uh Risho and Betelgeuse for the auto for the go to, which is funny. And all the the the, the little error we got for the Asimuth and yeah the, uh, uh, altitude, Asimut and altitude for a polar alignment. Okay, yeah, those only watch into the north. Yeah, with, with only a, a window of like 20 degrees, 20 degrees. Like we, we can only see about a an, an, an eighth of the, of, of the sky here. And I think even less. And yeah, that's that's the guiding right there. Kind of bumpy. Mm -hmm. Here another picture. Well, we can we can we can try to to get maybe twenty or 
20 pictures of 30 seconds or maybe one minute, we don't have problem. We can we can put, uh, normally the idea here is put the the, the ISO for this camera, it's, it's okay in 800 uh, ISO, that is, mm -hmm. is a, a, a good point, it's the sweet point. And it's something that is great for this camera. Well, I think that let, next, uh, next uh, week uh, I can show you next presentation I can show you a, a, a great picture of of a nebula Orion nebula from the city maybe we can try we can try something more this tonight well this is my my presentation thank you so much Cesar oh, hey. excellent <laughs> yep yeah, it's great to have you guys on and uh to be uh, observing with you from the live from the balconies of uh, Buenos Aires, so it's great. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> yeah, yes, yes. It's something that that we we have uh, we have really. Uh, it's fun that we have the possibility, and of course, that my entire uh, idea of interaction to the people uh, to use their t own telescope in the middle of the city. Is something that every day, every day that, for example, we saw uh, many telescopes like um, the National Geographic 140, um, 114 millimeters. Uh, um, it's an entry level telescope. Um, the, the, the kids are making things very beautiful in, obs in observations. And it, it's a an entry level um very ed educative uh, telescope it's something that that is great for for kids uh, for people that are not kids and really they they use uh they start to use a telescope uh with open wide vision and this is very important that it, uh, it's it's very important to to don't have frustration about the first time that you use a telescope where the things were sometimes you use maybe 300, uh, 300 um, uh, uh, magnification, for example, mm -hmm. in a small telescope and the dealer don't tell him that don't use the barlow with the smaller, um, the smaller eyepiece the first time and maybe they use <laughs> the entire capacities of their telescopes um do you have very small refractors or and um, uh, the idea is is for is use uh, short tubes uh, with great optics and where the people the people understand understand uh, understand that that they are watching and the quantity of light in, in their in their eyes is enough to understand or see the nebula or see uh, a cluster, you know. Um, when the people tell me that, yes, I found Orion Nebula, I found, as you, as you told me, uh, maybe I, I know uh, uh, Omega Centauri. I remember the, the, the great day that we take a picture of Omega Centauri with the National Geographic 114 millimeters. The bumper tube. That is my favorite tube in my home. <laughs> the bumper tube is is it, it's a treasure in in the in our home. And you remember Scott that I showed you the the the, the tube. <laughs> and, yeah. Yes, and with them, yes, yes. Yeah. And I say something that is 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 great because no no it's maybe for a donation or for or for for use here in home. And we found with this very simple telescopes that you can make a dome. Uh, before to make a, a big stand, uh, telescope very special, you can prepare as customer uh, using something that you can start to learn and uh, enjoy more your second telescope that can be a, a special telescope like if, for example uh, you're in, in your back the big sun uh uh Maxwell telescope or the special refractors 
uh, of uh, the line of FTC 100. Of course, that that are beautiful, but if you start with a smaller and open wide vision telescope, you can enjoy a lot and you can learn a lot for the second telescope, your special buy, buying of, of the special telescope. Like this is RC telescope. You have a lot of, of, uh, uh, of um, focal length. Last week, we have many, many uh, problems with, you know, the collimations and you have, it's part of the, the fun. Maybe you have a lot of different, different things. When the people say, okay, I, I was frustrating because I can't make the, the right focus. And okay, some people that, for example, the people that fly airplanes, uh, model airplanes, models RC, sometimes they crash their their own uh, RC plane That's models. And it's part of learning how to do the, the yeah, absolutely. Yeah. No? yeah, and sometimes they are happy. Because why you are happy? Because, okay, I crash it. But I have my entire week to re to refurbish and um, repair. repair the, yes, uh, part of the hobby. We are we are kind of pacifists right now. Uh, yes, sometimes it's we it's, enjoy the suffering of, of learning. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, not not getting anything to work, not even the alignment, not even to go to anything, and then then it works for like one one microsecond. It works for one microsecond, and that's all the happiness. That's, that's all you right get there, yeah, <laughs> and that's enough to to have uh, enough uh, just to sustain you for a while, huh? Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's great. Well, guys, thank you so much. Uh, I want to thank You're the welcome. audience for tuning in um, for the uh, you know for our global star party, the hundred sixth edition, our hundred and seventh edition of the Global Star Party will be next Tuesday starting at 6 o'clock central um, and the theme uh, is ancient photons and so uh, looking forward to having uh, a great speaker lineup and um, a great lineup of, uh, of audience members here. If there's anyone out in the audience that would like to uh, give a presentation on Global Star Party simply get in touch with me. Um, you can use the letter S at explorescientific.com and I'd be happy to uh, arrange all of that for you. Um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's fun and thrilling to be in front of a global audience like this and, um, you know, it'll sharpen your presentation skills and, uh, you know, uh, give you some experience for giving more presentations to other clubs, which is what it's all about. So, yeah, Caesar, I have a question for you before we go. How many presentations are you now giving? Uh, or maybe a better question: On average, how many uh, lectures and presentations do you give a year? Uh, this year or in my entire career? <laughs> well, no. uh, you're, on, you're on Global Star Party. In average, yes, yes. That's about 52, 52 yeah. presentations a year, um, right? Uh, but uh, how about other clubs and stuff in Brazil? Uh, or in year, Argentina? Yes, this year uh, was fantastic because it was the, the first one from the pandemic time, uh, pandemic time, sorry. Uh, where uh, I started with the uh, Base Grande Star Party. Uh, this year, you know that we we uh, put in the calendar uh, start, uh, starting with uh, Catamarca Star Party. Uh, we made a lot of, uh, of uh, presentation with the guys of uh, San Miguel Observatory. And maybe we, I, I account now uh, about 10, uh, 10 uh, different um, different events. Uh, uh, county meetings and star parties and special uh, uh, meetings to, to, uh, to, for example, well, we, we, we preparing in our new store that we are making our 
new store in in, in the downtown of the mm -hmm. of the city. Mm -hmm. uh, we are having a basement, a big basement that we can uh, use like a warehouse in a middle part. In another middle part, it will be a small auditorium and a place for for uh, uh, to to recording uh, videos for mm -hmm. for Such social videos. for social right. yeah. yes for social media interactional me videos and yes. of course a uh, real real uh, live uh, place to to meet people to talk um we are really exciting with this uh, yes it will be a, a, a place live absolutely we, we, uh, we are having uh, actually they are they are, um, we have people working uh, in the basement because we are uh, restoring the complete basement to have of course a, a great place without humidity without you know uh, all about that you need to make a, a, a great place um, over this is a it's an optic store with a huge huge part of technology um 3d printers um, with, um i preparing um the, the, the machine for polish uh, mirrors um it, it will be a very interesting place to show to the people um a football test uh is ready to use in, in the basement mm -hmm. um, uh, as as a very interesting uh, test for quality, you know. Um, maybe we can do it uh, 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 with more in the future. We, can, uh, we are having a, a, a table for optics, for control, for control. Uh, uh, well, this is that really. It's a. Uh, it's it's a year where I have I'm having thirty years working in my business um, mm -hmm. is, is very very inspiring for me that is, is all alive uh, the years um selling telescope repairing uh, teaching to the people and i am preparing the new store like a, like a special 30 beer day uh, of my speciality is my that's store, great my shop. That's Right. And this is, it will be very, very uh, uh, exciting. Well, uh, when you're ready for it, Cesar, uh, we can also do uh, some special seminars for your, uh, for your customers, you know, for yes, your, yes, yes. your general right. public. I'm doing one uh, coming up here real soon for a dealer in Armenia, you know, so... Um, for Space Shop 42, and we've got lined up already uh, Christopher Go and um, Ocean uh, Zakarian. Uh, Ocean is one of the Twan uh, night sky photographers that is, does beautiful, uh, you know, night sky images from the, all these sacred sites and stuff like that around the world. Really cool. Um, so we're, it starts off with, uh, you know, night sky photography, planetary imaging, uh, and then we'll be doing deep sky imaging as well. So a kind of a four-part series, and we can repeat that uh, with an um, with, uh, audience for you as well. So let me know. Okay. It will be, it, it will be a pleasure, uh, and of course, that I am totally open to, to make this. And it's, 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 a, it's something that for me is very, great. very good, really great. great. Desire, thank you so much, uh, and uh, take care. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Take care, and take care to all the uh, audience here uh, watching. And uh, you guys, at least stay up and uh, or set an alarm and watch the um, uh, you know the Artemis launch here. So I think that uh, I think it will be historic if it takes off. Uh, and I, so far, I think everything still looks pretty good. So keep looking up, everyone.